Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to WSCT's first industry talk, Sipping Sustainably, Navigating Climate Change in the Global Drinks Industry. I'm Carolyn Degar, Marketing Director at WSCT. WCT is the, <coughs> the global leader in drinks education. We offer qualifications and courses in wine, spirits, sake, and from early next year, beer. You can take our qualifications in over 70 countries around the world through more than 800 course providers. We also offer a range of free and accessible educational content for drinks professionals and enthusiasts alike through our virtual global events hub. Today's webinar is part of our new industry talk series on the hub. Over the next few months, we'll be exploring key topics impacting the global drinks industry, including changing drinks habits, sustainable business practices, creating a more accessible and diverse drinks industry, as well as environmental impact, which we're covering today. I'm delighted that we've got nearly 500 people, in fact, over 500 people from 65 countries registered for today's talk. It's a truly global event. Please note that this session will be recorded and available to watch via YouTube after the session. If you've got any questions, can you please post them in the Q&A box? And we'll try and cover as many as possible at the end of the session. I'm now delighted to introduce our chair for today, Tom Mutram, General Manager of the Sustainable Wine Roundtable, our partners for today's session. Tom studied for a master's in international sustainability management in Berlin and Paris. He was part of the founding committee for the Sustainable Wine Roundtable and has since managed all aspects of the organization's growth. The Sustainable Wine Roundtable is a global platform for collaboration to advance sustainability across the wine industry. It's the only global independent roundtable to include the whole value chain. With over 100 members, it's the catalyst for driving collective action and knowledge sharing. It's currently developing practical tools, including a global reference framework for sustainable wine, and is looking at taking action in areas such as vineyard chemistry, labor standards, packaging, bottle weight, and low carbon logistics. So now, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Tom. Thank you, Karen. It's a delight to be here. And um, I'm really impressed by the uh, truly global audience, as you said. Um, great to see so much engagement in this topic. Um, as many of you may know, uh, the impacts of climate change are disrupting the environmental, economic and social systems we depend on. Um, but in today's talk, we'll be focusing primarily on the environmental impacts of climate change. And to explore this topic, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, four industry experts who each bring their own perspective on the topic. Uh, so let's start with some introductions. Uh, Michelle, can I turn to you first for a brief introduction? Yes. Hi. Can you tell us a bit about your um, yourself, your organization? Yes, uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I do a lot of different things, but in regards to climate change, I am the founder of Tasting Climate Change. So it is uh, an international symposium that brings the key people um, to discuss solution to adapt to and mitigate climate change from the vineyard to the glass. Uh, and in link to that, I wrote a book that was published in 2021 uh, in, in, and in French. It was uh, Which Wine for Tomorrow? So I co-wrote the book with a scientist, uh, Hervé Kenol, and a master of wine, Jeremy Corkingman, um, to offer um, a guideline, if you want, on possible solution. And the book is now available in, in Spanish, and uh, we're waiting for the English translation. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Rui, can I turn to you next? Yes, you can. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, the SWR and the WSCT for the opportunity to be part of this panel. It's always a great opportunity to learn, most of all, to learn, and, of course, trying to share something about this topic. So, quick introduction about, introduction about myself. My name is Gregor Silva. I'm Port Supply, Sustainability and Process Engineering Responsible Director. I'm based in Portugal and I've been from the cork business for the last 18 years. Uh, and the last three 
mostly dedicated to sustainability. Uh, so quick introduction to cork supply it belongs to a harvard one group that is dedicated to cork closing business for wines and spirits we also produce oak barrels for wine and labels for wine bottles especially in the australian market um so what, what can i say the harvard one group was founded in 1981 42 years now firstly dedicated to cork closures and then expanded the, the business to oak and to labels. Um, I'm very happy to be here. What can I say? And and this is a wine and spirit dedicated audience. Uh, and I'm really happy to share what Cork Supply commitment to sustainable development. How to talk, we believe that Cork can be a part of the solution in this topic in climate change. Um, and I have some numbers to share with you, but maybe I, I save it for my my for my part of the panel. Thanks, Ari. We're looking forward to hearing more from you. Um, Annabelle, can I turn to you? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Tom. I'm Annabelle Thomas, and I'm the CEO and founder of Nick Nian Distillery. We're a small, independent whiskey distillery on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and I really set up Nick Nian with a mission to do two things. The first was to pioneer sustainable production, and it's obviously the part we'll be talking about today but also to create exciting, forward-looking, modern spirits in, within the world of Scotch. Um, and from a sustainability point of view, I guess the key things that we have done already, and I always say this is a journey, we're not perfect, and we've also got a long way to go, but um, we power the distillery with 100% renewable energy. We only use organic barley um, to make our whiskey, so everything we make is certified organic, and that has both a biodiversity and a carbon benefit. Um, we have a closed loop water recycling system for all of our cooling water, which is the main water usage within whiskey, um, which is a not very technical solution called a cooling pond, but it's very simple and very effective. We recycle all of our waste at the farm that we're on, so the cows eat the spent grain. And we have also invested a lot of time and thought and effort into our packaging. So, for example, we use a bottle that's made out of 100% recycled glass. We only use natural cork and wood for our stoppers and so on. Um, and I guess we're hoping to show what is possible within the whiskey industry in particular um, by doing things in the most sustainable way possible. Looking forward to hearing about sort of shared learnings and um, hopefully some innovations to, um, to, to learn from. Um, just to complete our panel, uh, Ruth, can I um, turn, you, turn to you for a brief introduction? Yep, for sure. Thanks, Tom. I'm um, really excited to be here. My name is Ruth King, and I'm the program manager of Sustainable Wine Growing BC, uh, and that's British Columbia, uh, Canada. So I'm uh, located in Kelowna, BC, where it's uh, just about 7 a.m., and I apologize in advance if you hear children uh, and the pitter-patter of them getting ready for school. So <laughs> really excited to be here. Um, we have been uh, a project underway um, of the British Columbia uh, Grape Council, uh, Wine Grape Council for decades. And uh, we've been a certifying body for the last, uh, we're going into our fourth year. So we have 28 current uh, vineyard and winery members. And uh, so we're just kind of in the launch phase and we're uh, excited to welcome more vineyards and wineries this year. We have a whole bunch that have been working on certification. So, um, our platform is one of continuous improvement and uh, yeah, I guess that's that's a good start. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you all the, for those introductions. Um, now over the next 20 minutes, each of our speaker will have the opportunity to share their story in, in more detail and how they are experiencing climate change. Um, Michelle, if I can um, turn to you uh, first for a global <laughs> perspective on uh, climate change. Uh, you've obviously been doing a lot of work um, through your both your conference series uh, and writing your book and also through your you know, other engagements. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you, you've experienced climate change and what progress be, has been made in the wine industry in terms of um, you know, tackling and adapting to it? Yeah, I think it's thanks, Tom. I think it's always important to kind of lead the land, which, as you can imagine, is not a, a very positive one. Uh, and I, I always like that to be there, but also brief so that then we can engage and focus on the solution, because I think it's easy to get paralyzed when you just focus 
on what is, but I think we need to know what is. And just to give you a, a bit of overall picture, um, you know, as you probably all know, uh, if we look at the growth of the carbon emission in the atmosphere, it is directly linked to the growth in population, right? Uh, so, you know, in, in 2007, um, we, we were at about 7.7 7 billion people in, 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 on the planet. And uh, if we continue, the projected uh, population by 2050 is 9.1 billion. Um, if we look at that currently on the planet, according to the United Nation, 70% um, of the water on the planet is used for agriculture. Um, we saw what happened in 2018, uh, for example, in South Africa, where there was extreme drought and the people in Cape Town uh, were faced with a limited amount of water they could use. Uh, and they turned on and they look at people who were growing cereal and, and other type of, of, of food and told them they had to stop irrigating. Um, that gives us, I think, a little bit of an idea of what's coming down the road, especially knowing that we're gonna have this growth in population and an increased growth for, for food by 70%. So that's that's just pure number. Um, and so I think water be, will become an issue. I think we'll, we'll probably talk about water. Um, and then the other thing is the carbon emission. I, I still hear today people saying, yes, but we've had some period of drought and heat before throughout the age. Uh, but I always like to say, yeah, but we've never had uh, the carbon emission in the atmosphere that we have right now. In 2019, the carbon emission, according to the United Nations, was at 4.15 ppm. And if we continue that growth uh, in 40 years, we'll be over 600 ppm. That means that it's a point of non-return. It's going to be very difficult for most living species, including us, to live on the planet. Uh, so uh, the good thing is the sort of uh, things that we can do, and I think we'll, we'll look at it today, what, in, what it means for the wine industry, I think, of course, it varies from one region to one region, but overall, everyone is experiencing shorter growing season. So we harvest earlier. And the challenge is how do we harvest when the grape is as we want, meaning we have a balance of acid sugar while we still have the phenolic ripeness. Uh, sometimes you have high sugar going up, the phenolic are, are not quite ripe, but the sugar is so high that you're harvesting. So to harvest at a crucial time is, is becoming difficult. Um, you know, we also see that a growing cycle that's very, very disturbed. Uh, you want the water during the winter time when often you will get some storms in the summertime uh, between fruit set and veraison, which is not the ideal time for high amount of water. We see hail, uh, we see frost in places that frost was not an issue anymore. We think of, for example, the Southern Rhone Valley, the Northern Rhone Valley. Um, so, uh, period of drought. Um, so, of course, what it's leading to is decrease in production and, and financial pressure on producers. I was just in Tuscany a month ago. Um, some people lost 80% of the production. Uh, in Canada this year, we saw, you know, Nova Scotia uh, in February, we had a very cold vortex. Some people lost all of their vineyards. They're going to have to replant. They will have to wait three years to replant. Uh, pest and disease increasing everywhere. We're seeing some cycles in the insect, more cycles. So the grape moth, for example, instead of having one cycle, you have multiple cycle within a year. So there's no consistency from year to year. And I think we make a shortcut when we say that some region will benefit and some region will suffer. I live in Quebec. We don't think of wine in Quebec. We do make wine. In 2021, we had an amazing growth season. We saw wine with natural percentage of alcohol at 12.5, uh, 13 without chaptalization. This year, we saw a very, very hard condition with lots of rain, lots of fungal diseases. So it's not true that cool area like Quebec would, will just clearly benefit. We benefit if everything goes according to plan. And if we have 
a warmer season and we, we benefit from the growth in temperature. But unfortunately, everyone is facing chaos. So that's kind of my, my a bit, uh, overall look. It's not a very positive one, but the reason I started climate change and I think the next conference will take place in January 22nd, 23rd, you can be there uh, online or in Montreal. You can go to the website and look at it. The reason I do this is I truly believe that the wine industry has the power of turning things around. Uh, according to INRA, which is a science, which is a research center in France, uh, if we do the right thing with agriculture, we can sequestrate up to 41% of the CO2 emission in the soil. So I think that all of us, if we put things forward, uh, there's lots of things we can do to turn things around. Well, that's a great introduction. I think, it, you know, as you've said, it's important to highlight the risks, the real risks that exist, but also the opportunity to take action. Uh, Ruth, uh, can we now zoom in on uh, British Columbia and um, hear from you on, on how you're experiencing climate change in your region and how your, um, you know, wine producers, are they adapting or are they, um, you know, are they experiencing how um, the issues that uh, Michelle has highlighted with the, with the losses? What, you know, what's your story? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, and thanks for that very bright and sunny picture there, Michelle. <laughs> um, I wish I could follow up with tons of great news, but um, yeah, coming from British Columbia, we definitely are experiencing those issues and more. Um, <clears throat> I When I initially tried to answer this question, I had quite the laundry list um, of ideas for challenges that we're facing and uh, in the interest of time, I boiled it down to two main issues and uh, tried to speak to the adaptations that we're working with. Um, so the number one issue, as Michelle alluded, is crop damage for sure for our area. Um, <clears throat> the weather in the last three years um, specifically, but you know, late as of late has been dramatic. Uh, the 2021 heat dome, followed by a severely cold winter, left a lot of plants damaged. And then last year, uh, last winter, December 2022, was uh, the polar vortex in some places of Canada, but here in BC, it was just uh, extreme cold. Um, and depending on who you speak with and what they grow here in BC, there's between 30 and 70% uh, crop loss, like complete crop loss, uh, and need for replant. So where we're looking at, which is devastating for small and medium enterprises, uh, and, and big business alike, but especially for the small and medium, uh, businesses here. So, um, that has quite the trickle down effect, I think. And, uh, for numbers, I guess, uh, to put that into perspective, um, the wine and grape, supply chain here in BC uh, generated $3.75 billion in economic activity in 2019. So before uh, these devastating years of COVID and then um, heat dome and polar vortexes, um, that $3.7 billion included $750 million in, in wages and $440 million in local, provincial, and federal tax revenue. So although we are a very small wine region, we contribute a, a huge amount to the production of BC and, and Canada. So um, the way that we need to, I guess the solution to this is to replant and to do that in a meaningful way. You know, we can't just pick up the phone and uh, call our vine supply company and just order, you know, the same number of Merlot plants that just died. Uh, I think what we need to do is look to data forecasting and modeling and try to figure out what's what's going to thrive in our specific areas. Uh, speaking from the Okanagan Valley um, specifically, I guess we're a long skinny wine region um, with many little microclimates all along. So what works for the neighbor might not work for us. Um, and I think we need to, as, a, as an industry, change our mindset and get away from that, you know, next year will be better kind of farmers thinking, you know, it's kind of classic that they're very resilient, you know, people and uh, expecting next year to be better is, is no longer working for us. So 
looking to what what will work in the future, I think, um, is what we need to do. And looking to root stocks that are uh, more, you know, efficient with water use and more resilient in uh, extreme temperatures. I think that will also help us. And, and these things take time. And that's really the, the main challenge is these small, medium, and even the large enterprises, they're, they're experiencing this hardship right now. And to look to a company that has, you know, relatively thin margins and expect them to survive for the, you know, three to five years that it takes to replant and realize a crop, um, or even to, you know, step back and do the research and figure out what will actually survive here and, and what is meaningful to plant. I think that's, that's really challenging. So, um, in the short term, I think producers are are looking for ways to pivot uh, within their, you know, their business, their portfolio, what they can offer, um, you know, their price points. They're also looking to agritourism, I think, uh, to weather the storm here quite a bit. They're looking to leverage, you know, the assets, their property um, and how to invite people and, and kind of make up the margin there. Um, so that's my number one. My second uh, big challenge um, which Michelle also mentioned was the water and I have an exclamation mark, um, because I'm, I'm coming again from Kelowna, BC, and that's in the Okanagan Valley where we draw our agricultural water from the lake, which is also, um, it's a very long skinny lake and it's, it's super deep. So we have, we have a nice volume in, you know, a normal year, but, uh, the, um, the lake is fed by by rain and snow, so pre precipitation, which is uh, in the decline if you look over the last 25 years. Um, and just speaking about this year, so 2023, we've uh, realized 129 millimeters, which is half of what we had last year. And uh, it's the lowest in the last 25 years, plus, plus, plus. Um, so it's, it's kind of scary. And the... Uh, the, and I have a side note here, I guess, the, the change in the timing of when we get our water as well. So when it rains and when it snows and when the snow melts and how early our springs have become, um, that has changed, you know, when the water is available to farmers. And uh, we've also experienced some pretty significant powdery mildew this year in the Okanagan Valley. And that has you know, in understanding the, the life cycle of powdery mildew, when it's wet and when it's dry really determines, you know, how, how vicious it's going to be. There's lots of chatter also about, uh, you know, uh, spray resistance in powdery mildew. And so the, you know, direct uh, pressure of the disease isn't necessarily singularly weather related, but uh, it's it's worth noting that when we have all these challenges, we also have, you know, you know, there's a trickle down with um, pest and, and disease pressure. So, um, so back to the timing of the snowfall. Um, so it's coming, the snowfall is, is happening in smaller amounts and it's melting and becoming available in the water um, that we draw from uh, earlier and not when we need it, when the vines are, are actively growing, when we're, you know, going through fruit set and so forth. So um, extremely dry uh, end of season and harvest kind of times. And then I think we've skated by for the most part. When, when push comes to shove, though, the city water utility will be facing a choice. Do they send water to homes or to the farmers, you know, growing potatoes and blueberries, or do they send it to wine grapes? And I don't think any of us are uh, comfortable betting that wine grapes are going to win that um, that fight. So I think the solution and, well, part of the solution and, and kind of what we're, as an industry, working on right now is uh, tapping into government funding. So the Ministry of Agriculture runs a program here called Investment Agriculture Foundation, and they do have a $20 million project um, for water infrastructure. And I think at the farm level, that's a, a daunting thing to undertake. You know, what, what part of your property are you going to put this water collection receptacle? Um, where are you going to be treating your water? But it is the reality. 
and it's something that we need to, you know, uh, come to terms with. We need to dedicate a part of our land to collecting our own water. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's mostly, those are my two big, you know, highlights, <laughs> if you will, lowlights. Um, and I wish I had better news to share, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's a great starting point and, it, you know, it shows that, you know, no region is sort of immune from the effects of climate change and we all need to be working together to be able to sort of build in that resilience. Uh, Rui, can I um, ask you to sort of shed some light on how the cork industry is, is dealing with the effects of climate change, but also, you know, how can it be part of the solution? Actually, I do believe that cork is part of the solution and... Um... Not, not for the reason that I work for a car company. I actually believe that car can be a part of the solution. And we are still suffering. We are, we are suffering like in the wine business, suffering about climate change. We have some new species developing car forests. We have the quality of corks just going down. So we need to take action. Um, but uh, if I can talk about my perspective and the perspective of cork supply as a company, we need to look at the problem in two different ways. So the first one is related to our raw material. So uh, because of the, in the fact that we are handling with the forest products and we are pretty much interconnected with all that happens in the forest ecosystem. So we need to uh, protect that. And the second part is because we are a transformation company, a production company. So we need to take actions in terms of CHG management like everyone else. So we need to make to do our own efforts, you know, day-to-day -day business, to do the responsible business, to manage ESG as it deserves. Um, so in the first perspective, and we, I actually believe that we that using a natural product, and uh, Quark is a 100% renewable source, uh, can be a part form for today's environmental change, challenges, and not, 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 not just only uh, climate change. Uh, and the most obvious is carbon sequestration and forest preservation. So cork trees have unique ability to absorb and store significant amounts of carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. So uh, we are talking about 14 megatons of CO2 per year, if we consider the 2.1 million hectares of forest, of cork forest. That is pretty much every, every cork forest is in the Mediterranean area. Uh, so this process helps mitigate the effects of climate change by reducing the CO2 levels in the atmosphere, of course. Uh, and again, I, I hope everyone knows, but when we harvest cork, we're just stripping the bark from the tree. The process doesn't harm the cork itself. So it's pretty much a sustainable process method. It, it ensures the longevity of the tree, and this the tree continues to absorb um, CO2 continuous promoting photosynthesis up to 200 years. So we don't damage the tree at all. So that's why we say it's 100% renewable. Um, another subject that is really important is biodiversity and the ecosystem service that is provided by the, by the cork forests. So um, the cork forests are biodiversity hotspots. Uh, it supports a wide array of plants and animal species, preserving these ecosystems ensure the continuation of vital uh, service, such as pollination, water regulation, and soil fertility. Actually, you could see the ecosystem one of the most sustainable ecosystems having, having a positive impact on biodiversity. So if you think about it, the cork forest um, uh, is the opposite of growing wine, that is a monoculture. So in the cork forest, we, uh, we can get like 125 species per, per square meter uh, and talk about uh, the flora and up to 30, 30, 37 species of mammal, depending on the ecosystem. So it's a very rich ex ecosystem that we need to make sure to maintain. So this biodiversity ecosystem are also proven to be more resilient to environmental changes like climate change that we are, we are expecting. So the conservation of the cork oak forest must, must be a priority in fighting climate change. Um, again, a recent uh, study uh, published. If you wanna, you wanna put a value on nature. These ecosystems service have been recently recently evaluated with a minimum of two hundred euros per hectare, so one hundred and nineteen dollars, uh, only for carbon sequestration and soil preservation. If it, it, it can go 
it's five times more if we uh, consider other factors like fire protection, water regulation, and of course, climate change. This is just consider the raw material, how do we manage the forest, how we look at the forest, how we look at our products. Again, we as a company, we need to manage ESG like, um, like other companies. So we develop internally um, um, integrated approach to sustainable development. We use the, um, the sustainable development goals for the United Nations. And of course, the SDG number 13 related to climate action is, has an important role. Um, so we call it harvesting for the future is our uh, internal uh, sustainability agenda. Uh, and then we manage all the three components, not just the environment, but also the social and governance. In the end of the day, just be, just being responsible. I agree, and everything that we heard so far, we are in the time of disruptive, disruptive me measures, but sometimes we need to be responsible and we need to do the incremental measures. But I agree that we are um, running out of time. Um, so in our strategy, we are, implementing actions to our journey to zero carbon footprint in all our products. We are investing in renewable energy generation, eco-design our products, part of the fact that we believe that Cork is natural eco-design, but we, we, we think we can do better and investing uh, in process efficiency. So an important measure that we talk about Cork is actually we achieve full circularity in all the cork extracted from the forest. So we believe that it is a noble material. So everything that we take, 100% that we take from the forest, we use and we improve. So even if we don't produce corks, cork stoppers, we can, even with the resins, we can produce energy. So in the last three years, all the increases in production were uh, based on renewable energy. Um, we're using the cork as biomass, as, as our uh, source of fuel. We also implement last year, uh, the, the, every, every single piece of roof that we had, we, we implemented solar panels to increase our rene renewable energy ratio. We are now in 55%, and we hopefully until the end of the decade, we reach uh, almost 80%. Um, in terms of eco design, uh, last year we we will look at our products and say, well, how can we do better? So we developed new two new products. Uh, we develop a bar top capsule solution. We are we're not producing bar tops. We actually we 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 recommend um, a wooden a wooden top, but uh, we have customers that still prefer the plastic ones. And we develop um, um, a new bar tub that is a, a solution that has a bio-based polymer and is uh, and, and and it is combined with cork waste. So it's a new way of uh, reusing our our waste in cork. And also introducing our technical cork lines, uh, we call it Vink Natura. That is a new technical cork that we replace our our uh, fossil fuel based binder with um, vegetable 100 percent place uh, polyols, so we can increase the vegetable sources from 75 to 90 percent in our technical corks. Um, we still have a lot to do. Uh, like Ruth is saying, we're not perfect. Uh, we need to be transparent about it. I, I believe is one of the most important things. It is transparent and responsible. We still have a lot to do in, in terms of process efficiency in, in the technological development. But to and actually internally, uh, we feel do we have the obligation to preserve the environmental advantage of this wonderful material that is cork. So uh, we actually think that. Like we need cooperation, we need collaboration with different stakeholders. We we try to work with customers and distributors, and even this uh, SWR um, uh, actions. We need to be a part of it because no one gonna do this um, alone. Um, so, in conclusion, ask me your, your answer your question, Tom. So, I, I I do believe that the court can contribute to um, can contribute to this enormous challenge that is climate change. Um, it's from carbon sequestration, the biodiversity conservation and sustainable economic process, uh, Cork can uh, be perfectly aligned with the principles with a more environmental and conscious future. So answer your question with a simple yes. Yes, Cork can be a part of the solution.
Well, that's, that's good to hear a positive answer to that question. And um, there's lots of topics Rui's mentioned um, in your in your piece there, which hopefully people can follow up on because uh, there's many detailed subjects which you've mentioned, which um, need more than half an hour to cover. So uh, I'm going to turn to um, Annabelle now. We're going to step outside of the wine industry and um, learn a bit about whiskey. Um, Annabelle, what's your experience been of climate change and how have you approached um, sustainability within your uh, family business? Um, so I think, you know, like every industry, the whiskey industry is exposed to climate change in various ways, although perhaps not in quite such a obvious way as the wine industry, because most distilleries don't grow the crops themselves. And I think, as we've heard, that is, you know, a really key area where climate change is directly impacting businesses. Um but you know, in we're still relying on an agriculture ingredient in single malts case, that's that's barley. Um and whilst I think Scottish barley, which is what we use, hasn't been exposed yet to some of the harsher effects of climate change, it absolutely will be in future. And other makers within the Scotch industry and whiskey makers further afield who are sourcing barley not just from Scotland will be feeling that already. Um the second thing that the whiskey industry needs to think about is water. It's not something that people often think of as a problem in Scotland because people think it rains all the time. And whilst it might feel like that, we are already suffering from water shortages and some of the big rev rivers that are associated with the whiskey industry like the Spey are seeing really low water levels already. Um, and thinking about how we can conserve and preserve and improve those water courses and reduce the amount of water that the industry is using is really important but I think fundamentally the whiskey industry needs to play its part in solving the problem and that means leading the way and transition to renewable energy because distilling is a very energy intensive process if you've ever been to a distillery you'll have felt the heat coming off the stills and we're basically boiling giant kettles every single day um, so I think that has to be the absolute first priority for the whiskey industry is moving to renewable energy. And then there's a fourth one, which people in the industry are thinking a lot about, but maybe is not such a widely um, thought about issue, which is peat. So we don't use peat in our whiskey um, because, you know, we're a relatively recent addition to the whiskey industry we only started distilling six years ago and it was pretty obvious six years ago that digging up peat and burning it is not a sustainable thing to do um not only does that release thousands of years of carbon that's been sequestered in that peat bog but it also disrupts a very biodiverse and important um habitat however if you're a whiskey that has been around for many many decades and you've pinned your taste profile to peat you've got a really serious problem because, you know, and we don't have a solution for that at the moment. Unlike something like renewable energy, there are technological solutions out there. There are problems implementing them. It takes money and time and, you know, perhaps some further technical innovation, but Pete, we don't have a good replacement for at the moment. And that's a real, that's a real challenge for the whiskey industry. Um, but there are solutions for the other pieces. Um, for example, on the energy side, so we use biomass. Um, and the reason we do that is because we are literally right next door to a commercial forest, but we're also in the middle of nowhere. So we have no access to anything else. We only have a forest. And I always think that part of the solutions for all climate change and environmental issues has to be looking at what's around you and using the most sensible option. So that's not a good solution for, for other distilleries in Scotland who are on islands with no forest, for example. But there is really interesting work also going on in hydrogen in Scotland, and hopefully perhaps the whiskey industry can be at the forefront of helping push forward those kind of new technologies and how they might how they might integrate into big industry. The second thing is efficiency. I think this is something that goes for absolutely every, every industry out there, whether that's water or energy efficiency, making our production processes more efficient makes sense and I think is absolutely essential. The third one is packaging, and I think this is a really interesting one, and it affects you know, the whole alcohol industry, but it is also something that, relatively speaking, can be changed quite quickly, unlike changing your entire energy system for a distillery, for example, which takes a huge amount of planning and enormous amount of capital investment. 
packaging I feel should be moving a lot quicker than it is so whether that is making sure that you've got no mixed materials in your gift box making all gift boxes optional light weighting bottles our bottle is basically as light as it can be but is also made out of 100 recycled clear glass which brings the carbon footprint of that bottle down by 40 percent um and making sure that you're integrating recycled materials into all the other parts of the you know the packaging whether that's the outer boxes that you're sending it in or whatever it is and then the last one is agriculture um i think the whiskey industry has a opportunity to push the agriculture sector that we're buying from i.e largely barley growers mm. towards better solutions for their farming whether that is organic as we've done or whether it's more regenerative agriculture solutions where something like biodiversity is measured or soil carbon is measured i think is really critical and i think you know the whiskey industry as a whole buys so much barley that actually the more questions the industry can ask about what is your soil carbon and are you sequestering more carbon in your soil every year or not? Have you measured biodiversity on your farm? And if not, why not? And please, can you start doing it? Because we're not going to buy from you anymore. If you do, if you don't, the, you know, the industry has a lot of power in that sense and hopefully can make some really positive changes. Great. Well, I think there's clearly some shared learnings there and shared experiences with, with the wine industry. Um, just want to move on to our sort of second part of this discussion and, and just focus on sort of the role of collaboration in, in helping to ta tackle climate change. Michelle, can I um, turn to you for uh, maybe some examples around um, collaboration and uh, potential solutions or initiatives which you've um, learned about through your conference or your, through the research of your book? Is there anything that sort of stands out to you as, as um, something you'd like to share and highlight today? Yeah, I think I think the, the main message there is I don't think we can get out of this by ourselves. Um, I think we really need and, and, you know, the reason I started the conference in the beginning is that, as you know, uh, especially the wine industry is very fragmented. Everyone is, bu is busy doing their own thing because they're busy doing what they're doing. If you're a producer, you have so much to do that. To, to attend conference or to talk to someone else or to learn what's being done in another country. You don't always have the time because there's so much you need to manage already. Um, the fact is though, is, you know, right now, there are some of the issues that people are facing that someone else has already faced or have done research on. For example, this summer, um, I was asked to the conference Gigondas for the producers because they're facing drought for the first time. And they wanted me to bring um, the knowledge of what California and Australia has been doing with drought and irrigation. Because historically, Gigantas, for example, they never irrigated. Now, every year, they're asking the irrigation to irrigate because the drought is so much. So sharing, well, you know, what Australia has been doing where the water costs so much they irrigate, but they're very mindful about how much they irrigate because they cannot afford to, to overuse it, um, is one example. Uh, you know, the other thing is I was talking about fungal diseases. It's interesting to see how everyone is exploring the solution around that because in the past we would say, well, region where it's really uh, close to the ocean or it rains a lot, they, they're the one facing difficulties. Um, well, in the Chianti area this year, you know, it's it's they're they're more inland and they lost a lot of crop to to that problem. So looking at talking to other people who have faced that that problem, um, and you know, at, at my last conference, uh, there was a producer here in Quebec who used to have hybrids and to to uh, to help with the fungal diseases and he kind of stopped and turned into vitis vinifera and from the conference he actually went to visit a producer in Trentino Alto Adige who has been working exclusively for hybrids for 20 years because they don't spray at all so it, it's just and I always like to say we tend to surround ourselves with people who think like us, because that's how humans are. But I really believe that you need to sit beside someone who doesn't think like you 
to kind of open your your mindset um and 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 look at things differently and maybe at the end of the conversation you will come on the other side with a perspective that you did not have in the past the example of what i was telling you with the producer going back to hybrids was quite convinced that hybrids was not the thing for many reasons yet you know that conference kind of changed their mind and it's it's just one example and i also you know, keep uh, keeping up with what's being done in the research center. Um, Ruth was talking about fungal diseases increasing in, in British Columbia, and it's a fairly dry, arid condition. Um, the guys and I in university, uh, the research center for climate change are doing a lot of research in that regard. And one of the research they're doing is called the FACE project. And they have put Cabernet Sauvignon and Riesling um under elevated co2 so it's kind of a in an area where it's elevated co2 and they're realizing that actually when you put the plant under elevated co2 the stomata of the plant is open longer and therefore there's more chance of fungal diseases so it's not just what's actually happening in the area it's directly linked with the co2 emission so there's so much we don't know there's so much research happening and I really believe this is why more than ever we need to collaborate with the competitors um you know it, it's because with a big challenge like this everyone will sink if we don't share knowledge Champagne was the first region to calculate the carbon emission as a wine region you can imagine and in Champagne it's very competitive the brand are so important but they had to come together to understand what the CO2 emission was in the region and what they could do to, to mitigate and, and change. So hmm. uh, yeah, I couldn't emphasize enough how collaboration is, is key even with the person that you're competing with. Does that resonate with you, Ruth? Uh, what form does sort of collaboration take at the WS, uh, w, SWBC, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> All the letters. Yeah, 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 it, yeah it really does. Um, I think, there's kind of three levels um, of how we could approach collaboration. There's the government support, and that would be kind of initial relief for our our little industry here um, specifically, but probably around the world, there could be some more, you know, top down sharing of funds and uh, setting up spaces for collaboration. So we find here that uh, networking is really lacking. And, you know, um, like Michelle mentioned, you know, in, in Champagne, where they are very competitive. Uh, we also have that competition here at, at, at uh, I have <laughs> screaming children, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have uh, yeah, the competition still and people are kind of, you know, um, they avoid showing what's under the hood, if you will. Uh, and it's kind of, that 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 has to be a mindset of the past and to move forward and you know survive this current situation and thrive in the future we really need to um, be more willing to share our tips and tricks um, it's not necessarily giving up any secret sauce you know people can still go back and and you know not do it as well as you or maybe find an an improvement on your system and that will just help the tide rise for all the ships in our industry I think um industry-wide research and and development investment I think is super important and uh the as I mentioned earlier the wine grape council is kind of my you know mother, organization they they've had uh, swbc as a project of theirs their main mandate is research and development um and the way we operate is on levies so when our tonnage is down um the ten dollar per ton levy that we collect we've been given you know permission and uh authority to collect that levy uh, at the council they you know have less they just have less money to share on research and development and to put towards projects, meaningful projects that will keep our industry um, going. So in, in times like this, when we're down 70%, 50 to 70%, you know, across the board, um, we have less funding power to put towards research and development. And that will, that will hurt us for years to come. 
Um, and, and so that's really sad. And, and just to have some support again from that top level, I think is what we really need at the moment. And then uh, at the producer level, I think as an individual company or as, you know, a, a, a region, like I mentioned, where, you know, it's it's a couple hours between the top of the Okanagan to the bottom. So there's little kind of microclimates and there's um, there's groups that could be working together, associations that could possibly be looking at bulk ordering of product um, so that, you know, everybody would be using the same glass. But if that's the solution, so be it. Um, <clears throat> I know, you know, your fancy heavy bottle or, you know, your reverse taper or um, whatever might have been kind of a quality indicator or a, a market differentiation tool in the past. It, it really can't be anymore. Um, so we all need to be looking towards sustainable uh, packaging for sure. So, yeah. And that's something you highlighted, Annabelle's initiative that you're working on. Um, being based in quite a remote part of um, the West Coast of Scotland, is it, to what extent does collaboration play a role in your day-to-day -day, um, operations? Um, well, literally day-to-day, -day, not very much, because we haven't got anyone to collaborate with very closely. But <laughs> um, reflecting a lot of the things that Ruth has said, I think the Scotch industry in particular benefits from a decades long, very strong trade body, the SWA, which has grown out of um, A, a need to protect Scotch around the world, but B, this, um, because everybody trades with each other for blends within Scotch, competitors are also suppliers and buyers. So everybody knows each other in the industry and they have the industry has this very strong history of collaboration. And I think, as a result, actually, the SWA has set a very good vision for decarbonizing and is definitely doing a great job of pushing the industry in the right direction. But I think we also try to do our own bit individually, for example, by publishing a sustainability report every year where we talk about the things that we've been, we have been doing, but we also talk about the things that we still want to do. And that has produced some really excellent collaboration on a small scale where, you know, people read about the enzymes we've switched to use to clean the equipment and then they contact us and it's like so where do we get it from we want to trial it what your learnings that sort of thing and I think that's a really super positive thing um the you know but in yeah it it, it, it can be tricky though as well because people mm. do still sometimes have a feeling that it's a kind of USP or you know it's somehow anti-competitive to be sharing these things with with others in the industry and I, I I mean I echo everything that you guys have said is we just we, we're past that point this can't be the case anymore we've all got to work together um to try and solve things as fast as possible Really, with um the cork industry you, you mentioned that um the social aspect is a sort of key part of um the sustainability agenda and I know understand Corks rely heavily on um, the communities that exist around, or the cork forests rely heavily on the, the communities that live around them. How do you sort of interact with um, other stakeholders who work in the industry as uh, from cork supplies perspective? Regarding the social aspect, you mean? Yes, yeah. So um, it's very important. So we had the cork industry it has it has some, some so it's about two percent of ex, uh, exports in Portugal. We talk about one billion euros in trades. It's it's quite quite a lot. With, and we are also talk about eight eight thousand direct jobs in the cork industry. So that's a lot. About six hundred and fifty uh, companies fully dedicated to cork, cork transformation, especially to uh, to produce cork stoppers. And we are talking about small. Enterprises. We talk family-owned business, so it's very important for us as a big company to support those business. So our relationship is more is more and more like partnership, not just buying and selling. We need to work with them all year. We need to support them, and we need to be there when 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 there's trouble. So um, even now, when the the supply chains all around the world are. are how do I say this? Not stopped, but uh, is cooling down. 
we need to be careful because all these small companies, all these small suppliers are our partners. So, so we need to work with them. So a lot of collaborations. So for instance, we have some, some projects um, regarding process efficiency. So uh, we have process engineering in house. So we work with them to improve their processes, to improve their energy management systems. So we, one of, in my point of view, one of the things that we can actually make a difference in sustainability is work with our suppliers and to teach them and to bring them to to the to the to this cause. I want to say cause uh, because uh, most of these companies of the six hundred and fifty companies they are struggling between the end of the world and the end of the month. You know, so we need to make him make him aware. That yeah, that we get answers like yeah, we know the world is gonna going come into an end, but I need to put uh, I need to pay salaries in the end of the month. So we need to work with them. We need to work or, or to make to you help them to uh, to make the better a better decisions. Um, like in training, for instance, we are struggling um, um, to get some some manual labor. Uh, in Cork, so uh, so there are some jobs that are really manual right now, and and we know that young younger generations don't want to do it. So, in terms of equipment or developed technology, is really hard for the Cork business because it's a small small business around the world. So the big companies, big tech companies, don't want to develop uh, equipment for us. So we need to do it ourselves, or we are develop a training a training program that we actually train uh, people, young people that want to do it. And then we, uh, we, we keep like, uh, fill our needs and we, and the people get trained and we, uh, and they are ready to go to the workforce with all the, all the core companies. So uh, the community aspect, the social aspect is very important for us because it's still, it's still very small company based, you know, and, um, despite of the fact that five major groups, but they fed all these small companies that need to be to to stay active. So it's very important to us. Well, that's a nice segue um, to our final part of this uh, uh, industry talk. Um, we've got a few minutes left for some questions from the audience. Uh, Tonya Raw has uh, has asked the panel, what do each of you want students of wine to be learning regarding climate change as they prepare for careers in the industry? And how might WSET help prepare students? Who wants to take that one on? <laughs> That's why I wrote the book because everyone, yeah. it's so funny, so many people were sending me message. Can I have one place where I can learn the fundamentals of it and what can be done? Unfortunately, it's in French and in Spanish. So um, the English version is not there yet, but it's it's quite a complete guide in terms of, you know, from A to, to, to Z what what can be done but yeah it's only in french and spanish i can well, throw a good an reason idea. to learn another language uh, sorry ruth go ahead <laughs> um i can throw an idea out there for uh students of wine i think that um something that the wine industry really gets hung up on is uh a fear of consumer perception so especially around packaging um, and that is where we can make the biggest dent in the shortest period of time on our carbon emissions and the sustainability of the entire industry. So if we can figure out how to change consumer perception like quickly, <laughs> um, I think that would be a, you know, a significant um, benefit to our industry. And Ruth, if I may add to this, I think we talk a lot about collaborating within the wine industry. I think the, the, the industry, the spirit and wine industry need to work together to help consumers make a better, better choice. Because, you know, that packaging, I hear a lot of people saying, well, we're a premium producer and it's still a way to distinguish ourselves from our competitors. In 2023, I'm sorry, if you have a heavyweight bottle, it's irresponsible. And I think we have to collaborate together to convey that message to consumer. I could not agree more. For sure. And and to build on that, we can look to um, Norway and Denmark and their requirements in the monopoly for lightweight packaging and alternative packaging, um, organic, sustainable, whatever it might be. But they're they're forcing the consumer 
to adapt and to change. And that's something that we need to do at, you know, a much higher level. Like it can't be the producer's responsibility uh, to change consumer packaging. One small producer can't just, you know, approach the market with a, um, you know, a, a, what are the little pouches called Tetra pack or, or something really, you know, out there because they'll be ignored and people will just continue to do what they've always done. So um, consumer behavior is uh, always been, has always been a tricky one. And it's, it's not something that we can change overnight, but it's not, and it, and it really can't be the responsibility of the producer. It has to be uh, led by the industry powers, the LDB here in, in BC um, and monopolies or other organizations out, out there in the world. I would say though, Ruth, that we shouldn't just, small producers shouldn't think they can't have an impact though either, because we have seen that and we are tiny in the, you know, relative to the big Scotch producers. And even just asking the question, whilst you might not get an answer straight away, you might be ignored the first time, it does make people think. And we make an effort, for example, to send supply questionnaires to all of our suppliers, asking them what their carbon footprint is. Now, most of them don't know, but the point is you've asked the question. And I think the same can be said on, you know, in the customer direction as well, the sales direction. A lot of our distributors still think gift boxes are essential for all the sales they make. But every time we talk to them, we ask them the question again, can you take them without gift boxes? And, you know, it's taken us three years in our biggest market, but now they take some without gift boxes. So, you know, I think we can, even the small producers can all do their bit to try and influence suppliers, customers, and ultimately consumers as well. And we shouldn't shirk responsibility for that just because we're small. Yeah, for sure. I like that sentiment. And I think that uh, we can consider ourselves as producers, the very first consumer of glass, of all those packaging products. And in that way, we should vote with our dollar and uh, just pick something smart. And, you know, we kind of have to do it together. I'm thinking of producers I know in this region, and there's no way any one person is going to be as bold as Nick Nian and, uh, <laughs> and just force, you know, that change here. It, the margins are so thin. Every bottle sale matters so much to these producers here. It's, uh, we can't, it's just so risky. And I think in the short term, we won't convince anybody to be that you know, renegade. So but I think if anyone is listening to this and wondering whether to do that, you know, to do the thing that seems risky, if your gut says yes, do it. We were we were told we were completely mad to put our whiskey, our premium whiskey in a hundred percent recycled, well, you can't see that very well, clear glass because it's kind of greeny, it doesn't look like what premium spirit should be in. It's got little bubbles in it because our QA standards are a bit lower again for sustainability reasons. Most glass producers in the UK told us no one wants this, we'll never make it. And, you know, I think, I hope in the three years that we've had our whiskey in this bottle, we've managed to completely change perceptions of what 100% recycled glass can be. So if there's people out there that are feeling brave, do it. <laughs> I agree. And also the press looks at that more and more. And I think when small producers like this get the intention from the press and everyone is talking about it, there's, there's a group of journalists in, in Canada, when they try a wine, they have a balance in the office and they call it the wall, the wall of shame. And so they actually weight the bottle and they have all the producers who are not doing the right thing. They will put the list and everyone is following it. Eventually, if your producer will not follow and you get bad press continuously because you have a, a heavy package, I'm sorry, but you have no choice to follow. Um, so I, I think I, I agree with you. Like the small producer, um, prestigious producer have have also the, the power of changing things. Yeah. Well, I think that's a fantastic point to leave it on. I think everyone can sort of take action in their own form, take responsibility and, and collaborate. Um, but thank you so much for this um, first industry talk. Uh, thank you to the panel. Um, thank you to the audience and your engagement. And we're looking host, uh, looking forward to the next one. Um, so back to you, Carolyn. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, that was a really insightful session. Um, it's quite disquieting to see the impact that climate change has had already in our industry, but good to see the industry working collaboratively to put creative solutions in place. So thanks to our panellists, Michelle, Ruth, Rhee and Annabelle for your contributions, and to you, Tom, for sharing. 
and for putting the panel together with the Sustainable Wine Roundtable. Lastly, thanks to you all for watching our inaugural industry talk. It would be great help now if you could um, complete the feedback poll, which should be coming up on your screen. Uh, the recording of the session will be emailed to you all, as well as being available to watch on our events hub on YouTube, where you can also catch up on all our previous events. If you're interested in finding out more about WCT and our qualification, you can go to wctglobal.com. We look forward to seeing you at our next industry talk, which will look at the low no category and is planned for February next year. Sign up for our global e-newsletter to ensure you receive either updates. Thanks very much again and goodbye.